My name is Jean Muntz, a member of Wild Ones of Northern King County Chapter, and we're happy to have the Gail Borden Library partnering with us to bring you this presentation today. It is part of the community read that's been going on of the book, Nature's Best Hope, An Approach to Conservation That Starts in Your Yard by Doug Ptolemy. Notice that the, that the book can, can be obtained, excuse me, I'm having trouble getting my slide to advance. Click. Click, there we go. Um, our Wild Ones chapter, uh, well, notice that you can obtain the book, of course, from the library, but um, discounted at a discounted price if you wanna own one from Al's Cafe and not listed, also Arabica Cafe is carrying the discounted books for us. Our Wild Ones chapter is currently promoting a community-wide initiative called Start in Your Yard to bring the ideas put forth in this book to homeowners. If you go to our website, startinyouryard.com, info about this initiative and the opportunity to register for more of these free virtual book discussions and presentations related to gardening with natives is available to you. You will also see links to a video that Dr. Ptolemy has done, as well as links to see the presentations that you might have missed that have all been, are already been presented. I will give you more info after today's presentation, which is called the biodynamic engine that drives our ecosystem. And it's presented by Deb Perryman McMullen. Deb is an esteemed educator a science teacher for 25 years and currently holds the position of coordinator for the Office of K through 12 Science and Planetarium for School District Q46. She also serves on the Elgin Sustainability Commission for the city. I turn it to you, Deb. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, don't we have an amazing community? Um, you know, just thinking about uh, the power of, of, of Jean and Nancy and the Wild Ones um, coming forward and bringing this programming and then having such a responsive um, uh, community that the, that the, that the library would, would take this on. And so I really appreciate all of you very, very much. Um, just a great place to live. Uh, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me, hold on, let me just move some things around here so I can access my slides. All right. Um, so this is a, a, a presentation that I'm really excited to give. Um, I think you guys are gonna see me um, become a little bit nerdy because uh, our ecosystems are truly driven by several components. And so what I wanna do is give you an overview of those components. And then because I'm an educator, I'm gonna be asking you guys some questions. Um, please feel free to put those answers into the chat um, because of course I can't just, um, just give you some information I wanna check for learning and then also um, try as best we can to have um, a virtual uh, conversation about the importance of these ecosystems. Um, so uh, I think I have to start though a little bit about myself growing up and, and maybe why I am um, you know, so um, interested in, in nature. So this is a photo um, of, the, of where I grew up. So when I would wake up in the morning, this is actually an evening uh, picture or go to bed, this was my view. Um, this is what I saw. This is a little lake, uh, Crooked Lake in Petoskey, Michigan. That's where I grew up. Um, just a little piece of um, trivia around that. Um, the last flock of passenger pigeons was actually um, on Crooked Lake. Um, so the last documented flock. Uh, and of course, the story of Martha is very important to this whole story of, of biodiversity in our engines. And then I think the other reason that I am the way I am is my dad. So that's a, that's a picture of my dad. We um, were on a family camping trip. Um, you can see our paddles there. We, we paddled into um, a very remote location and, and we're camping as a family. Um, my dad is, uh, was an educator, 40 years in a classroom, fifth grade classroom, and um, he never answered a question. <laughs> he never answered a question. He always gave me another question, something else to think about. And I, and I at the time, I'm sure I was very, very annoyed by that, but um, 
honestly, now I think it's it's why I am so inquisitive um, and why I want to learn so much about our natural world is from that gift that my dad gave me about, um, you know, let's just keep asking questions. So the biodynamic engine uh, is made up of several different components. Atmosphere, lithosphere, cryosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere. And so what I wanna do is just use a couple of slides for each to kind of give you a little bit of an overview, and then we'll tie it all together about its importance. This is an amazing photo. Um, I don't know how many of you were watching the Perseverance um, landing that took place. That was a really exciting um, time uh, last week. Uh, but this is a picture that was um, taken by NASA and Scott Kelly, um, who is a retired astronaut, I think says it best. Um, you see how fragile the atmosphere looks. It's very thin. It's almost like a thin contact lens over somebody's eye. And in fact, if you look at this photo and you see that little skid of light over the planet, that's our atmosphere. If we're standing on the ground and we're thinking about the atmosphere, the atmosphere seems huge. But our atmosphere is actually really fragile and it's really small and it's a closed system. It's very important that we understand that the atmosphere is a closed system. We'll talk about why that's important in a second. So then one of the other things I want to show you and remind you of, this is a very cool website, and I'm happy to give these slides to anybody so you can have the links and the resources and all those things. Um, check this out. What is that? Anybody in the chat? What are those, what are those green lines? What are they? Anybody want to venture to guess? It's okay to be wrong. Wind or currents, love it. Yeah, this is a really, really cool website. Um, if I go down here, uh, it actually is our wind and it's showing us, um, you know, wind speeds. What's really cool too is I can manipulate it and look at the wind speeds anywhere else. So wind. If we've got a closed system and our wind uh, is, is in all of these different directions, it's moving in all these, the question I have is what's the purpose of winds and how do they interact in our, in, our, um, in our atmosphere? Why are they important? So we'll hold on for that one for a second. Thank you for playing with me, by the way. Lithosphere. Now I am not an expert in the lithosphere. In fact, I don't think I'm an expert in any of these, but the one that I probably know the least about is the lithosphere. Um, but essentially the lithosphere is our solid earth. Um, it is, um, all of the, from where we stand all the way to the center of the earth. Um, it involves the rock cycle. And so having understanding about heat and pressure and weathering and time and how rocks can change into different forms depending on the atmosphere that, um, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the conditions that are there. So it's tectonic plates, it's how mountains occur, it's volcanoes, it's oceanic crust versus continental crust. That is our lithosphere. But much like we experienced with um, the atmosphere, it, it, it's not static, all right? So I'm gonna give you a second to just kind of look at this model. And then I wanna show you guys an animation. So here's animation one. Sorry, my internet is being slow right now. When I practiced this morning, I had no spinnies. Anybody want to guess what the colors are representing? So in the chat, what are the colors? Yeah, that's right. And you guys probably know 
that uh, warm air rises, cold air sinks, but we could expand that to anything that's considered a fluid, right? That's right, the red is heat. That's exactly right, Susan, the red is heat and the blue represents cold. <clears throat> okay, so let's see here. If I were to play this animation, it's gonna show you um, the opposite. It's gonna show you how cold works. So let's just think about those two things, the animation, and if we apply it to the center of our earth, there's actually circulation that occurs in our, in our earth's core. And that circulation leads to plates moving and moves and, and, and determines to, some, to a large part what kinds of ecosystems are above it. So just, you know, a couple little things to think about. Hydrosphere. Now, if I had to be biased and pick a favorite sphere, this might be one of them. Uh, I'm actually a limnologist, so I'm a freshwater scientist. Um, and the water cycle is very, very important. Um, you guys probably know the water cycle really well. One thing I want to talk about uh, is this diagram. It's a very important diagram, so let me give you a few seconds to kind of think about it and look at it. And then if I were to put all of the Earth's water, if I was magic, I could put all of the Earth's water into this gallon jug. And I wanted to pour out just the amount that represents the 2.5 fresh percent of fresh water. It would represent it ma mathematically in about a third of a cup. And so if I pour, this is all of the fresh water we have at any one time to use for our purposes and for every living thing on the planet. Now, the water shifts between the different components. So it's not like this water in here is always only fresh water. It actually moves through all of those components that were listed on that diagram. But at any one time, we have approximately 2.5% of all water available as fresh water for us to use for survival, for our industries, and also for our, every living thing. So just something else to think about as we walk through this. Cryosphere. A lot of people don't um, know about the cryosphere. It's actually part of, um, of the hydrosphere. The cryosphere is the, um, is the water that is um, uh, frozen or in some form of frozen. So it could be sea ice, it could be snow, glaciers, it can be in all of those different forms. The cryosphere you're probably learning more about as we learn more and more about the impacts of global climate change. Um, global weirding is probably a better word for it and actually a scientific used word now. Um, it's the cryosphere that basically helps us keep our planet, um, the temperature normalized. And you might be surprised to find out who's actually part of the cryosphere. So actually we in Illinois, we are part of the cryosphere. Most people think of the cryosphere as only the poles, but actually if you look in the here, we've got, we're part of snow. And so for a good portion of the year, we're part of the cryosphere. All of these regions that are colored on this map are important to helping to maintain the Earth's temperatures. And, uh, you know, just something else to keep in mind as we walk through. <clears throat> biosphere. Uh, the biosphere is probably what most of us think about when we think about planet Earth. Um, and so here I have some uh, picture of, a, of some young people that are in Poplar Creek by Elgin High School, and they are interacting with, um, with some living things. So they're in the water looking for benthic macroinvertebrates, um, and so they're counting them and, and learning about them. Um, but in this picture, they actually are interacting with some of the other spheres. So anything living is considered the biosphere whether it's a bacteria, uh, a single-celled organism, 
uh, simple um, macro invertebrate all the way up through human, which we might consider human to be most complex. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but we're all part of the biosphere, anything that is a living thing. All right. So why do we care about the biosphere? Something that we don't always think about is that the biosphere is how nutrients cycle. So I have two cycles here. Um, I have a nitrate cycle and then I have a, a carbon cycle. But actually anything and everything is cycled through um, our organ, um, sorry, yes, through organisms throughout the planet. So we could probably add, we could add phosphorus. There's, there's lots of different nutrient cycles that we could add to this, um, to this particular, to this particular picture. So scientifically, we call the biodynamic engine the biogeochemical cycle. And what I wanna do now is ask you what patterns, so you can put these in the chat. So I ran through those very quickly, but did anybody pick up on any, any patterns? So let me put the chat up here so I can see you. Did you guys notice in those slides and that little brief discussion and introduction, what did you guys notice? What patterns did you see? circular, lots of movement, up and down movement, increasingly complex. Cycles are ever changing, things are flowing. Exactly. I think you guys are ready for a test question. Connection, I love it. These are all great words. All right, so here we go. If we look at this picture of these young people, what interactions, who, which, which of the biochemical components or the biodynamic engine are they interacting with? And you can put that in the chat. So what are, the, where are, what are they interacting with here? Which of, the, which of the components of the biogeochemical? And not just the name of it. So don't just say, atmos okay, biosphere, Corey, add to that. Can you pick out an exact evidence, a piece, a piece that you see that's the, that is the biosphere? How do you know biosphere? Mary Elsie's cat. Very good. The plants. Now you've got plants and soil. Is soil bios? Or is it lithos? Is it both? Yeah, it's loaded with animals. That's right. The, the, your soil, the biodiversity of your soil is amazing. Yes, atmosphere. We've got trees, right? And the trees are interacting with the atmosphere because they are um, sequestering carbon in order to do photosynthesis. Um, yes, maybe not cryosphere, right? Maybe not cryosphere. Can anybody think of a way that, although it's not in this picture, how they may not be directly interacting with the cryosphere, can anybody think of a reason why really they are still interacting with the cryosphere? This picture appears to me to be potentially early spring. Yeah, it probably melted, right? So some of the groundwater that's there is gonna be giving life. Um, and also the fact that the temperature is normalized that's normalized by your cryosphere. So even if we don't have snow cover here in Elgin, there is snow and ice cover in other parts of the world that are allowing us to normalize our temperatures. Yes, perfect. Um, I'm wondering, has anybody heard of um, the laws of thermodynamics? There are three of them. Anybody heard of the laws of thermodynamics? Hi, Mary. Yeah, okay, so the um, laws of thermodynamics, what those, what those um, tell us is that mass, matter, and energy cannot be created and destroyed. So when I did my example of water, when I said all of the water that we have on the planet is all the water we'll ever have on our planet, that is an absolute finite statement. The water moves around in the cycle and when it moves around the earth, it brings with it different things. It might bring with it seeds. It might bring with it a nutrient. It might bring with it something we don't want passed through like mercury. Um, there's a really interesting study that was done um, that I think highlights this point. 
um, there was a uh, there was a they were they were doing a study on the health of breast milk in an urban community um, because there was a high incident of mercury and they were trying to figure out where the mercury was coming from and how it was being passed and they wanted to know if it was being passed mother to child to child. The scientists who did the study wanted to find a control group, right? In any, in any study, you wanna have a control group. And so they actually went to um, a very remote region of the world um, that happened to be in a polar ecosystem. And their idea was that the mothers there would not have mercury um, in, their, in their systems. Um, it actually turned out that they had as high and in some instances, higher instances than the mothers in these urban settings. So that brought back a whole lot of questions for scientists. And we learned that sometimes things travel by the wind, and by water cycle. Um, and so we have to really think about what we're doing because once we put it into our biogeochemical cycles, we can interrupt its health in some ways. So you guys are absolutely right. Basically, anytime we're doing anything, we could point to evidence that shows us that every little living thing is interacting with every part of the biogeochemical cycle at all times. You, you can't get away from it. It's just the way the world works. And it's an important way that the world works. All right, I have two pictures here. First question is, what components of the biodynamic engine are, are you directly, is directly interacting? So if you had to pick, now, now, let's, now let's fine tune it, because we have to be able, we, we now know that they're all interacting, but let's fine tune it a little bit. And let me just say that I'm looking for two, I, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking for three biodynamic engines components that are interacting. So in these pictures, of the, bio the five that we've been talking about, I'm looking for three that are directly interacting in this picture that, I'm, that, I, wanna, that I wanna study, that I wanna focus on. What three do you think? Hydrolitho, yes. Hydrolitho, perfect. Cryosphere, perfect. Okay. My next question is, in the, of these photos, photo A, Photo B, which do you think illustrates a healthier bank, stream bank? Yeah, I can't fool you guys. Everybody's saying B. Yeah, awesome. So here's why. Um, the bank, the photo on um, A, so your, your photo A shows what we call scarring. And basically what has happened is the water, which is very, very powerful, um, has velocity and it has volume and it is wiping away, destabilizing the bank. And so when you look at this picture, you see this very steep, you see that there are roots um, involved, those are exposed. And all of this lithosphere has now fallen into this river system. So soil and water, is pretty natural. Like that, that's one of the things that, um, that definitely happens, it's natural. Even in photo B, there's gonna be some erosion of a string bank and some of that soil is gonna be lifted and carried down the stream. It's, it's just naturally what happens in a moving water system. But let's talk about why we might wanna be concerned about those components interacting in that way. Um, soil, uh, although carries nutrients, so the soil particles tend to be positively or negatively charged, and because they're positively or negatively charged, they carry nutrients, different kinds of nutrients throughout the aquatic system. So they're very important to our aquatic systems. However, too much of these soils actually clog the gills of the macroinvertebrates and fish that are in our, on our waterways. So in that way, we've got a negative interaction with the lithosphere, with our biosphere. And, and then hydrosphere is the deliverer of the bad news, right? So then the question becomes, how do we remediate that? And we have to back up even further and say to ourselves, now that I'm studying these components, this dynamic system, how do I fix it? Well, we're seeing more and more streams look like this 
because we're using our surface waters in a different way. Storm water, when, when for example, when all of our snow melts, that's gonna then become uh, storm water. Storm water is carried from our homes and our yards and through sewer systems and then um, dumps directly into a freshwater system. With the exception in our area of, of the city of Chicago, that's one of the few that the stormwater actually goes to a water treatment plant. Um, but in our region, it's going to go, and in, in Elgin, it's going to go directly from our yard and through it, through, travel through a system of pipes and then go to um, the Fox River. Our creeks and rivers are not meant, they were not originally designed to be carriers of stormwater. That, that was not what, what how it, the whole system was put together. So now we're putting an influx of water in there. We're putting too much water in there. The system isn't built for all of that water. And so we end up having scarring like this, which means that now we're increasing the amount of sediment that's in there. We're impacting wildlife. And also we can potentially impact the amount of um, pollutants that are going into that water stream. So as somebody who studies freshwater systems, I want to know the cause. I know the cause of this to be stormwater. And so because I understand that and I know a little bit about the lithosphere and I know a little bit about hydrosphere, I can come up with ways that we can potentially, um, potentially help uh, our systems. Okay, sorry. Somebody, Jean, do you have your, do you need me to pause or? Okay, someone's raising their hand, so I just want to make sure we're okay. Um, so by understanding the biodynamic engine and understanding about how the different components are supposed to work and what and being able to recognize when they're not working, we can backpedal and figure out ways to fix what's happening. So if I move to our next photo. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, um, but uh, creeks, the way that they're set up, um, they're, they're set up to be recharged during a couple times of year. So what are our biodynamic interactions in this photo? So which of our components are, oh, someone has put their hand up. Uh, yeah, I can, um, I can allow the person to talk to somebody. Sorry, I just saw this chat. They can, you can unmute them. Yeah, Deb, I'm going to go ahead and unmute. It's Terry Horney. She wants to talk. Terry, you can go ahead and unmute your mic. I'm sorry. I didn't know I had put my hand up. I apologize. <laughs> That's quite all right. That's quite all right. That happens, um, that happens um, a lot. Uh, all right. That's okay. Um, correct. Hydro, bio, and litho are interacting in this. So here's what I want to tell you about how this system, about those components work together normally. Um, we have a river system, we have a creek system. Now what I want to tell you is this is Poplar Creek. I've studied Poplar Creek for many years with my students. You can see here that they are measuring the width of the, of the creek. When I first started at Elgin High School, uh, and we started collecting this data, the creek was widest at about 10 feet. This is way more than 10 feet. And over the years, it's gotten wider and wider and wider because of the photo I showed you before, that interaction between, uh, uh, that impact or feedback loop between too much water into the lithosphere, right? And so it eroded away. Now you might not think that's a problem and it doesn't look like a problem here because I, you know, I have water going bank to bank. But if you were to visit this system in a, in a, in a summer when we have um, little water, what ends up happening is the creeks end up having little pockets and the, with, with no connection. And so um, organisms, populations go down because the system is meant to A, flow in order to flow nutrients through the system and carry it all the way to the Gulf. Um, and two, have enough um, room and oxygen for those organisms to move between different breeding pools. Um, there are three different kinds of ecosystems in a river. So there are, um, there are um, pa, um, sorry, pools, riffles, and runs. And when we blow out the banks and make them wider, 
the normal flow of water no longer flows. And so we don't have nutrients flowing. We don't have organisms breeding correctly. Lots of things happen. Um, and so taking this kind of data and knowing and seeing that these things are happening, again, allows us to understand how the biodynamic engine works and how we can potentially work to, to repair what's happening. So two other things are really important that I want to talk about to help us, you know, with this whole picture. Um, here's a picture of some leaves. Um, and as you can see, another really important part of a, a creek structure um, on the banks, you have these trees. And so in the fall, the leaves fall into the water. And a really cool thing happens. Um, they fall in the water and they are immediately attacked by bacteria and fungus who start breaking it down. Then there's this other organism called the crane fly some people call them, the adults look like they call them mosquito eaters as an adult. But when they are um, a, a, a larva form, when they're, when they're um, a benthic macroinvertebrate, they look like a plump little caterpillar. They're, they, they remind, they're like a, it's like a cigar with a little wispy mouth. And these guys, along with some of the, um, the other mayflies and other things that shred up these leaves, uh, they are almost solely responsible for devouring all the leaves that fall in there. And they're not after the leaf, they're actually after the peanut butter. They're after the, the bacteria and they're after the, the fungus. But by doing that, they break and shred all of these leaves into little teeny pieces. Those then get delivered through the system all the way from Poplar Creek to the Fox River to the Illinois to the Mississippi and into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's how it's supposed to work. Those nutrients are meant to be cycling and moved through by those specific organisms. So if we remove those organisms, we, we have a problem. We, we no longer have this flow of nutrients. The other thing that has to happen in a creek system has to do with this animation. And so I'm gonna cross my fingers that I get this one to work a little better than the last time. So let's play this one. And this one is showing us the cycle, maybe. Winter, cold weather is essential to our water systems because it is during the fall and the winter when there's an interface between hydrosphere, surface water, and atmosphere. And that is when water exchanges oxygen. So during our cold months is when all of our surface waters get recharged with oxygen. And as they go through their cycle and we get into our warmer summer months, the oxygen is released. And so if we have a situation where we don't have cold, that cryosphere here in Illinois or that cold temperature, our water systems are not recharged with oxygen. And again, just like the nutrients, that oxygen is, is, is then transferred through movement of water all the way through Poplar Creek to the Fox, to the Illinois, to the Mississippi and into the Gulf. If the system stops in our, in our cryosphere, we don't have the recharge that we normally have. So I see something in the chat. Okay, so that so how does that work in places that are never cold? Um, so there may be other systems in play that bring oxygen into those, but just like um, just like transfer through wind and transfer through water, oxygen is going to be able to be regenerated into those regions by traveling. So our cold water here recharging the water, it doesn't stay here like in a river. I, I take a snapshot here, this, this you know, I, I, I go down into Poplar Creek, I bring up a glass full of water, I run tests on it. I have to understand that's a snapshot because that travels downstream. And so having systems in place, um, because, because we go from mountainous regions all the way down through a, a water system, oxygen, nutrients is all going to be transferred into, into those places. If we're talking about a place that never warms up, there's still going to be some oxygen in there. But if we study those regions, we're going to actually see different organisms there. 
Um, so for example, um, Mary, and, and, and just to show you as an example here in our region, um, another thing that's really important to this, this system that I'm talking about, this interface, is actually these tree overhangs. And when we study creek systems, we want to, we actually take, um, to, uh, in a stretch, we want to see how much of that is covered um, by, um, by overhanging uh, trees. The reason that's important is it shades the water and it helps to reduce the amount of oxygen that's lost. Okay, so that's one way. But if I were to, to study this region, which is very rocky, bottom substrate, lots of rocks, lots of overhang, and then I go upstream in Poplar Creek to um, the Forest Preserve that's there on 59 and uh, Schaumburg Road, uh, that's a grassland that's next to it and it's open. So if I were to test the oxygen levels at any one time between there and the um, between those two points, the oxygen is going to be very different, but so are the organisms that live there are going to be very different. So um, again, it's just this whole cycle that has to happen so that we can recharge um, and, and normally redistribute all of the, um, the oxygen levels. So great questions, and I love that you guys are, are thinking about this. Um, okay, so uh, one other thing I, I just want to bring up, um, I'm not sure it's a good idea that in the city of Elgin, we, we put all of our leaves in the street. And the reason I'm not sure that's a good idea is that um, you can actually put too many nutrients into an ecosystem. Um, that's what we're seeing happening actually in, um, in the Gulf. Um, you know, this is such a depressing topic, but uh, if you were to Google uh, dead zones, what you would realize is that there are regions of um, our oceans that have had too much nutrients delivered to them and they no longer function the way that they're supposed to function. So one of the things that our oceans are supposed to do is actually um, give off oxygen and fix carbon. Um, when we deliver too much nutrients into those regions, it changes the biochemistry of the water and actually reduces the amount of carbon that our oceans can hang on to. Um, and so um, I'm not certain if I if I look at the the globe in terms of um, these 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 ecological um, jobs that they're doing, um, I wonder if we might want to rethink putting our leaves into the street where um, they're then close to storm sewers and can and can add too much nutrient. Um, so just you know something else to kind of think about in terms of what we do. All right, I'm hoping this little video will come up. Um, it's, a, it's, I don't think it's going to, that's okay. All right, um, I took a video, a slow motion video. So I, um, I was walking to work and I found um, a bumblebee that was on, um, on a flower. Oh, here it comes. Nope, video can't be loaded. Um, what was really cool about it, and what I wanted to show you is I, I used the slow motion feature on my phone. Um, and I could actually see the pollen on its legs. Um, the other thing that's sort of amazing about uh, bumblebees is that aerodynamically, they just really should not um, be able to fly. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're not really, their structure and their, their function are one of those rare things that it doesn't all make sense, but for some reason it, it works, right? They're able to fly. Um, and so uh, I wanted to show you this photo um, and remind everybody that one out of every three bites that you take, and I have, in case you, you know, want to check it out yourself, I have the two um, papers that I read, um, about one out of every three bites of food um, you eat is, is, is from a pollinator. And so, you know, you wouldn't have this, and we wouldn't have these, and we wouldn't have these guys, um, we wouldn't even have these guys if we if it were not for pollinators. Um, I see a question here, so I'm going to take this question and then I'm going to come back to to the almonds. Um, let's see, we have a quarter acre pond on our property, but we have not planted trees around it because we were afraid of the detritus build yeah in the pond. Um, but we have no shade. Okay. Um, Oh, so I am not a pond expert. I, 
so I think there's a lot of things going on. Um, you could plant um, you could plant some trees and see if that helped. Um, my my immediate question would be um, where is the water coming from for this pond? Um, I, I think you know potentially a a, a, a more um, where you might want to start is um, where is the water coming from and how much nutrients is in the water. Um, I think that might be a, a place to start because when you see algae blooms, frequently it's because of excess nutrients. And I don't know if there's somebody in the room who is a, a better, a, you know, more expert. I'm not an expert in that particular thing, but I would, I would during, as, as you see meltwater coming, as you see a storm, I'd actually start filming around the pond to see where the water's coming from and then, you know, travel up the stream and see if it, if it, you know, is it coming from a pond or sorry, if from farm, is it coming from someone's lawn who uses a lot of chemical? Um, that would be something else. Oh, nutrient from neighbors line and and take up as much time as you want this is I love talking about this kind of stuff um so thank you so much for that question that's what I that's what I would guess is um can you work which is a whole nother thing that I want to get into in a minute can you work with your neighbor um to figure out to, a way to reduce the the nutrient load um you know side note something else that's happening um if you start noticing in your yard that things are dying in particular trees like leaves are wilting um, that potentially could come from um, the, the lift from um, somebody using an herbicide. So there are a lot of things that can happen with the people around us um, that are using different products that impact us. And so um, it all comes back down, I think, to being, being a neighbor and, and, and trying to do some education. Um, but of course, that can also be a little bit difficult. So I want to, um, thinking about these pollinators for a second, I have here um, some almonds. Um, most likely these almonds came from, um, I'm, I'm sure they came from California, you know, probably. Um, and they probably were grown during the excessive droughts that California has. And so with each of these products, one of the things that I often think about is um, that we're shipping our water all over the place. Um, if you purchase flowers for a loved one, most likely they have come from Central America or even some places um, within the continent of, of Africa. And those flowers get shipped and, and, and something I, someone brought this to my attention, I, I'd never thought about the water that's in these products. And so what impact does it have to ship the water in these almonds from California to me here in Illinois? Is there a broader exchange between moving water from one location to another? Um, I don't know many people who are studying it. Um, I think it's something that we really do need to study um, because I'm not sure what that, what that impact is. Um, and so uh, just you know something else to think about in terms of um, you know, when we're moving products around. All right, so let me give you this picture. Um, what are the, first of all, if you know what this person is doing, please don't reveal it yet. <laughs> but we have a, a gentleman um, scaling a beautiful tree with some beautiful blossoms. Um, what components of the biodynamic engine is this gentleman interacting with? So what, what are our components here? Did I, did I lose people? So when you look at this picture, yeah, bios for sure, because we've got this beautiful tree. I'm not sure what it is. It's obviously a fruit tree of some sort. Um, lithosphere, yeah, because that tree is growing into something, right? And you also see the mountains behind, right, in the picture. Um, anybody vote atmosphere? Yeah, okay, there we go. Very good. Yeah, that's where I, that's where I would go too. Um, okay, so now I wanna ask you guys, does anybody know what this gentleman is doing? Yeah, he's pollinating. Um, so this is a photo coming out of China. 
um, if you go to, um, I think on all of my, I worked really hard on all my pictures to make sure that I have the photo um, credit so you can go see the picture and learn about it. Um, and of course, to give the, the person who took the picture or made the model credit. Um, but there are some regions in the world where we have to pay um, people to do um, the pollinators job, um, the insects job. And, and I guess you could argue that it's always good when someone has a job, right? It's always good when someone has a job. Um, but I think that for me, there are some concerns like why does this gentleman have to do the job? Um, are there not enough insects? Um, are they trying to do some kind of special um, pollination? Um, when you look at these pictures, what you'll find is this is a piece of bamboo and then there's like these little feathers on the end. And so they literally just, just sort of, um, for lack of a better term, you know, sort of tickle the flowers in order to exchange the, the, um, the, the pollen. Uh, and it always makes me wonder why? Why are we doing that? Why, why is that necessary? And so um, I wanna spend a couple of seconds to talk about this. Um, the earth's sustaining, self-sustaining mechanisms. Everything that I have talked to you about today are free services, free ecological services that our planet does for us. It generates oxygen, it regulates temperature, it helps us produce food. It keeps us safe. The, those five components work together to create this system of self-sustaining uh, mechanism. Um, and every time, everything that I've shown you that is an interruption, humans have had to interact to correct what was supposed to happen naturally. Um, and so I would argue, and again, this is just my personal opinion, I would argue that it costs a lot more to try to fix a self-sustaining mechanism than to let that self, self than to protect that self-sustaining mechanism. So I don't know how much that gentleman makes pollinating. Um, I'm grateful that he has the job, but it makes whatever product is coming from there more expensive for others because now we have to pay for something that was there all along. Um, and so the Earth's self-sustaining mechanisms are what we're talking about, and it's what I want to finish my talk on. Here's another photo of interrupted self-sustaining mechanisms. So I took this photo, um, and while I, I love this photo, it's one of, one of my favorite photos that I've taken in Elgin, um, it represents flooding. And uh, flooding costs us a lot. It, it, it costs us in human life, it costs us in property, um, and it costs us in water quality. Um, another thing that costs us is when we have these log jams. So we have a couple of things that can happen here. Um, with excess nutrient, um, we have dangers because these logs can then become lodged in, um, in uh, under um, expressways and in channels. Um, and I once asked um, a city of Elgin um, a public works person, how much does it cost? I don't know if you've ever seen after a flood, um, there'll be these, these log jams um, next to roadways. So if there's a bridge going over the roadway, there'll be these log jams. And they estimated that it was anywhere from one to $2,000 um, to, to clean those out. And so if you think about all the waterways and the bridges that we have in Elgin, that adds up to a lot of money. Um, and it's, you know, flooding um, happens for a couple of reasons. Um, development, um, the use of um, storm water, our stormwater system puts waters into um, systems that are not used to it. The creek beds get blown out. When they get blown out, we have trees falling in, we have more leaves falling in, um, and then these become potentially dangerous um, debris. Um, all of that costs us. And so when we don't think um, as a community about what we're doing with our stormwater, we have these unintended costs, right? And so then when we say, well, we wanna fix these and we say, we're gonna spend this amount of money to fix these, sometimes people see just the money that's coming out and they don't understand that there's actually a savings in money by preventing these kinds of events from happening. Sorry, my dog is barking. 
Okay, you're right. Uh, or loss of property or life to potential flooding. Um, so if my plea to you is to start thinking about these five components, how they interact, how they're supposed to interact naturally, and then first of all, how magnificent they are. I mean, I'm, I just am always in awe at our self-sustaining mechanisms. But what does it look like for us to try to put them back the way that they were? So I'm just gonna put it out there for you. Um, the wild ones have a really good way to fix almost all of the things that I've brought forward to you. When we plant natives, we're saving all of the drops of waters. We're putting the lithosphere where at first, we're, we're, we're keeping soil where it belongs. We're allowing gravity to work because when raindrops fall here, the raindrops are actually going to travel down through these root systems through the lithosphere, recharge our groundwater, prevent water from being overly abundant in our stream systems. And we're going to um, protect our waters, protect our lithosphere. These plants do a really good job of sequestering carbon. They also, trees and plants clean our atmosphere. Just this one simple act of starting in your yard can help pull together, these plants can help to pull together all five of those categories of components that I was talking about and do amazing reversal of some of the, the problems that we've created. We're reestablishing our biodynamic engine when we plant our milkweed. When we think about adding some cone flower, uh, we're bringing back our, our organisms. We're keeping our water where it belongs. We're doing so many things just by thinking about our biodynamic engine and planting plants, which become the center point of all of the other components. You don't have to think much about it, right? We can just, we can just do this system. I just wanna end with a couple of slides. Um, I taught a long time at Elgin High School. Um, now I'm an administrator in the district, but I taught a long time at Elgin High School. And I always make the plea um, that those of you that are in here, you probably have influences in organizations um, across the state and community and in the nation and maybe even the world. Um, I really think it's important that we bring kids to our planning tables. Um, one of the things that was a center point and still is the center point of the environmental science program at Elgin High School is this idea of community action and taking community action. And the more we can get kids to understand the importance of these biodynamic and how they have a role, and not just a role, but an absolute right to be involved and a responsibility to be involved, we bring them into the world as adults who are knowledgeable and voting and have connection and all of those things. So I just like to make that last plea. Um, and then I'm going to, here's my email if you wanna get a hold of me. Um, this is the last class I taught at Elgin High School. Um, I had them get together. Um, we have a whole bunch of equipment with us as you can see we were doing, it was um, spring, I'm sure you can tell. Uh, and we were doing some restoration work and then um, documenting that restoration work. So um, I wanna end there. Um, and so, um, does anybody have any more questions for me or should I stop screen sharing? Do you guys have questions for me? Oh, oh thank you, Mary. I'm glad it was a, a, a good presentation. All right, here's a question. Um, all right, how does fracking affect the biosphere? Um, all right, so fracking originates in the lithosphere, right? We're trying to extract um, a natural resource, um, uh, gases um, from our lithosphere. Um, this is probably controversial for some people, but uh, there are actually um, rock formations that are safer to extract this gas from than in others. Um, and so um, anytime you, uh, anytime this, and this includes groundwater, 
anytime we remove a substrate um, from our lithosphere, we actually um, change the amount of pressure being exerted from those pockets. So whether it's groundwater or it's um, oil or it's uh, natural gas, uh, under pressure, those things, um, sorry, confined, those things um, exert pressure. So when we remove those, um, those captured water, oil, um, uh, natural gas, we reduce, if you could think of it as a pillow, we flatten the pillow. And when we do that, we reduce the pressure which can cause the systems above to collapse. So one thing that can happen are sinkholes because they, they collapse, that's one thing. Um, and then that very often will lead to more erosion and those kinds of things. But another way that any, not just fracking, but any of our, um, our systems removal impact um, the biodiversity above if they're, if they're you know, um, carbon-based, is we're putting more carbon into our atmosphere, which leads to warmer ten temperatures, which makes it harder for um, the, it creates that global weirding. It causes the, um, the, that cryosphere to not work as well. And we don't have regulation of, of temperatures. Um, and so that can affect our, our biosphere as well. But another way that, that when we, when we you know, put down um, into our rock systems is the way that they crack or break leads, can lead to um, water sources. And so one of the things that we're finding with, um, with fracking is that we have an impact on our, on our water systems and then that impacts people and it impacts all things. So um, isn't it interesting how you can, it, it's actually sometimes really hard. I, I appreciate all of you saying that I'm a good teacher. I really appreciate you guys saying that. Um, it's actually really hard sometimes because when you're teaching environmental science and you see the interconnectedness and as an environmental science teacher, you know, I'm teaching about the five biodynamic um, systems and they all interact with each other in different ways. And so what becomes a problem in one region of the country through one action of say fracking becomes different in another region because of the kind of rock that's there, the density of the rock. Um, some might have problems with sinkholes, some might have bigger problems with um, drinking water or groundwater contamination. So it's so complex, but it's also why I love it, um, why I love it so much. Um, let's see, do we have any other, let's see. Maybe, maybe I will, if, if you guys notice questions I'm missing, if you wouldn't mind reading them to me. Yeah. Um... Uh, I had my eye on it and it moved. <laughs> Corey Bagalka was asking about um, tree revetment for erosion control. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, again, a, a kind of complex, um, complex thing. Uh, so as tall, on average, as tall as the tree is, is how deep the roots go. So if it's a 30 foot tree, um, it's gonna go into the ground 30 feet. Uh, another general rule, not necessarily an absolute rule, but another general rule is if you were to walk the drip line, so um, the drip line would be, I start at the trunk of the tree and I'm walking out to the edge of the tree. I look up and now I can see the edge of the, the crown of the tree and, and sky. If you were to walk that what we call drip line, that's also about how large the root system is of that tree. And so um, when in terms of erosion control, in terms of, of absorption of water, um, um, storm water, uh, critically important for erosion control and, and storm water control. But there is a flip side to that because you have to have the right trees. Um, on a bank, for example, um, if you have erosion taking place, if, like so if you're on Poplar Creek where you know you saw that one picture where there was that really heavy um, erosion scarring, um, sometimes that can actually be created or made faster by the kinds of trees that are there. So um, buckthorn would be an example. Um, there are buckthorn stands on edges of um, 
Poplar Creek, that as those roots get ex exposed and year after year of more water going through there, those trees can become unstable and fall in. And when they fall in, they take all of the soil that was around them with them and they take that entire bank. I'm gonna share again and let me go backwards to show you a picture. Um, that I think will help illustrate this. So if you think about this tree, I mean, you know, along our river, you know, we're, we're seeing climatic change. We're also seeing invasives, um, you know, coming into our, um, into our, our, our banks. Um, and so this looks to me like it's probably a, a box elder, which lived to be about 17 years or so. Um, and then classically, these guys are on the edge, they're the edge organism, and um, the bank gets washed away. And so if you imagine its root system, it's going to take all of the bank with it. So it's, it's kind of a complex answer in that, yes, trees Wow, they are so necessary for sediment control. There's an erosion control. They're so necessary for soaking up ground, um, I'm sorry, storm water. Um, they can help reduce flooding, um, but they do have to be the right kind of trees and they sort of have to be in the right place. Because if we have, I, 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 there's a bank by Elgin High School um, that each year we were, we were monitoring it. Um, I'm not sure that the people know, but like their bank is just washing away and it's a pretty, it's probably a 15 foot drop. And each year that those box elders keep falling in the next generation of, you know, in a box elder, the whole, it's taking out more than would have just gone with the soil. Um, and so I don't know if that answers your, your question. So yes, critically important, we've got to do it. We also, um, we need to be mindful of um, the, the climate models and make sure that we are getting um, plants that are um, going to withstand any kind of change. We need to start planting and thinking in that way now. Um, of what that looks like. We also need to, in terms of trees or anything else, we need to be thinking about the genetics. So I've been really careful about the um, milkweed that I've been bringing into my property. Um, and I make sure that I ethically harvest it from local sources. So in other words, I see it somewhere and I say, hey, um, ComEd on that strip, can I please go take some pods from you? And they usually say, of course, um, so that I have that genetic integrity as well. Um, but all of that is going to be important for erosion and, and storm curves. So I hope I, if I didn't answer it, please keep asking. Um, okay, so understanding the connections and impacts of global warming, where do you think the safest, most environmentally stable place is to live in the next 25, 10 to 50, 25 years? Um, okay. Um, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my thoughts, but I am not an expert in this. Um, my favorite, all-time favorite scientist is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, H-A-Y-H-O-E. She's on Facebook, she's on Twitter. She will answer all kinds of questions, reach out to her. She has this, um, this uh, show that she puts on, on YouTube um, and it's called Global Weirding and she answers all kinds of really cool questions. So um, I do recommend her as a resource for this, but here's what I think, Katrina. Um, First of all, um, I would not move away from the Midwest. Um, if it, you know, I think that um, if we can have wars over oil, <laughs> I can't imagine what will happen when we are faced with um, a life, such a life source as water. So I wouldn't move away from um, from the Great Lakes in terms of thinking about. Um, climate. Um, I think that if you look at the models, there's all kinds of shifting. So I also wonder if it might be, you know, a preferential choice. So I grew up in northern Michigan, and I happen to enjoy the cold, and I happen to enjoy the snow. I'm one of those weird people. Um, and, um, you know, the climate models right now are looking like we're actually going to have weather similar to Minnesota, the last time I checked. Um, that's cool with me, but I know lots of people who that would not be something that they, that they wanted. Um, and so there are a lot of um, things that I would be thinking about, but, but because I, and it might be my bias because I'm a limnologist, um, I think water is gonna become a huge issue. Um, it already is a huge issue. Um, I think that it's something that we in Elgin have to be thinking about. Um, you know, if you think about our stormwater that's melting right now, 
yeah, right? It's going to become stormwater or snow. Um, we're literally bleeding fresh water from our community. And we're putting it in the facts and we're sending it away. Um, I think that is a big mistake. And I think that it's, you know, stormwater is something that I think we have to look at because the, you know, the planet is giving us this fresh water and we have changed our system um, in a way that we're not able to catch it as it falls and, and keep it. So if I didn't answer that well enough, um, keep asking me. Um, I didn't understand how the water that, oh, affects us. Okay, when we, when we purchase it here. Okay, so um, great, great question. So any product that, I, um, that we purchase, uh, unless it's sourced and grown here locally with our water, we are purchasing it from someplace else. And so the water that was made to grow these almonds in California is now in the almonds. And then I go to the store and I purchase those almonds and I bring the almonds here, I use them and I eat them. And that is released from my biochemical system, right? As, as um, not to get be gross, but like it, it's released from me, I eat it and then it becomes part of our water cycle here. Um, and so my worry and, and, and thinking about water as much as I think about water, um, I wonder about the impact of agriculture. And I don't know that we look at it from a water shed point of view. So um, corn that is grown, um, you know, here in Elgin, um, is it and in, in it's shipped somewhere or it's made into biodiesel fuel or something like that. Um, that was water we used here to grow it and we're sending that product away and in it is our water. Um, and so that's, that's what, I, what I mean by that. It's, uh, I'm really wondering about um, the long-term impact of that. Um, just as a side note, maybe, the, maybe this will help. So um, uh, Japan approached um, probably first the United States and then went to Canada. Um, and they wanted to put, um, bring tankers into Lake Superior and collect fresh water and then take it back to Japan. And they were gonna pay a price to do that. Um, the, the byline of the contract was, um, well, we'll only take about as much as evaporates, you know, water cycle evaporates in a day you know, it still evaporates. When it evaporates, it stays in our local water. But now we're saying we're gonna take water, we're gonna allow it to go to Japan because they have trouble sourcing fresh water. Um, we are giving our water to them. We have less water here. We still have our water cycle, even though that's a giant, giant body of water. And even though um, uh, water cycles, right? water cycles happen locally in small, small ways. And so my question is with agriculture or with something bottled water, whatever it is, um, I don't think it's in a community's best interest to send their water away. I'm grateful because I happen to like almonds, but um, I just wonder about that impact. So if I didn't answer that, just keep asking me. Um, oh, 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 okay, thank you. Um, thank you for clarifying about revetment. So um, revetment meaning like Christmas trees anchoring the sides of the creek. Um, I think there are better ways for us to do that. I worry about Christmas trees um, or any other like because that is a it, it is a um, it is a bio system that is going to be broken down. And so I think we really have to be cautious, especially with what's going on with various dead zones in the world. I think we have to be really, really careful about the extra nutrients that we are putting into a system anywhere. And so, um, you know, and, and actually it's, when you try to, so let me go backwards. When we try to do anything to fix, um, to fix this kind of erosion, it's really hard. Um, what do you do to that system? You have to put it back to the way it was. And very often that means, you know, riprap or Ajax or, you know, something like that. Um, but we have to be careful about which system, which, what we're using. Um, and we have to make sure that we're not adding excess, um, 
you know, bio to that, excess nutrients to that. So that would be my only worry about that one. And let me go to this picture. I don't know if you guys can see, but these students are standing on an island of rocks. Um, those rocks were, are not there, that, that they are not supposed to be there. And in fact, this little hedge up here, this island that's right here, um, that looked like this a couple years prior. So where do these rocks come from? Well, people will, to protect their stream bank, they will put riprap down and then they'll put river rock down from someplace else, some other source, and they put that on there. And while it will work for a while, when as we have stronger and stronger storms, those storms are picking up those rocks because it, water is so powerful. Water is so powerful. And so we're seeing more 100 year level storms, meaning one, the worst storm that would happen once every 100 years. Um, the last few decades that I've been at Elgin, um, teaching at Elgin, we had two 100 year storms, 10 years apart. Those storms are so powerful, they're picking up this rock that are on the riprap and carrying them downstream. And so now we're having an added problem of these unnatural rocks um, being, being um, put in place, meant, you know, put in, 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 you know, in good faith, meant, meant to help, but now they're creating these, you know, very odd um, uh, situations where we have these unnatural islands. And there's actually one downstream in Poplar Creek um, on our Elgin property that is so large, it's now obstructing the flow of Poplar Creek in that region. So, um, uh, so I would, I would recommend, you know, not doing that. Now I haven't done any official research on that. Um, it'd be interesting to know what like the DNR would, would want to say. And in fact, I think I'm going to, I'm going to ask, you know, some of my DNR friends what they would say. Um, but that's my, that's my initial thoughts on using, um, you, you know, putting a Christmas tree in a, in a waterway. I think you'd be better off to putting it, you know, to letting it de decompose um, in a, in a, in a, um, in your compost pile, you know, cutting it up and, and getting rid of it that way. Deb, there's one more question that I see from Barbara Figglewitz. She's asking that you explain carbon sinks again. She said she has trouble getting it. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. Um, all right, this is such a this is such a cool question. I'm so glad you asked it because it's really important. And um, right now, it's critical that everybody understands it. So let me go back to some photos. Um, I think I'm going the wrong way. No, I'm going the right way. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Um, I said earlier that um, the three laws of thermodynamics, right? All of the mass, matter, and energy that we have on the planet is all of the mass, matter, and energy that we have on the planet. But that's not true in one area. The sun sends UV light to us every day. By the way, I don't know if anybody else was excited to wake up at 5.30 and see that the sun was up, but I was super excited to see that sun up at 5.30. Um, but the second it crests our um, atmosphere, and no matter where it is on the earth, right, because some places the sun is up, right, um, it's sending UV light. So the, so the one source of energy that is always being sent to us and replaced is, um, is the sun. Now, not all UV light reaches the earth. There's this thing called an energy budget, um, the earth's energy budget. And maybe, um, mm, yeah, I'm gonna see if I can find this because this is gonna help. Um, so let me see if I can find a good picture of the earth's energy budget. Thank you for your patience. You were watching me um, fumble trying to type because I'm nervous. <laughs> All right, um, okay, so here's a picture of the Earth's energy budget. And let me see if I can make it here for you. It's gonna take me to a website. I hope I can find it quickly. Okay. Come on, you photo, I would like you to be bigger. Okay, let me put this way. All right, okay, so hopefully that's sort of bigger. 100% of the Earth's sun is going to head toward the planet. Um, it's going to uh, approximately 30%, so I always think of it as 30, 30, 30, 
um, approximately 30% of it is going to be bounced off the various um, components of our atmosphere back out into space. So UV light um, is a really unique kind of wavelength. Um, and it's, it, you could, you can, you know, it's sort of visible light. It's, it's kind of why we see things, um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, the rest of it then comes toward the earth. Some of it is going to be absorbed by the earth in order to um, uh, have plants grow. So through photosynthesis. And then the weird thing that happens is UV light, when it hits the surface, a good amount of it actually bounces back up into the atmosphere but it changes its wavelength. It now becomes irradiated light or IR light. So UV light, not all of it gets in, thank goodness. If it all got in, we would be in big trouble. Some of it is absorbed by our plants and then some of it bounces up. So when we say carbon sink, what we're talking about is the component of our energy budget that absorbs the, the carbon and a good portion of it is absorbed by our plants doing photosynthesis. So a carbon sink could be anything that, that um, uses UV light um, in order to ch um, change carbon dioxide into usable energy by the rest of us because um, you know we can't lay out in the sun and get recharged with energy because our system is not structured to do that. Plants are structured to do that. So they take every day, they take the plants light, the, the UV light that's sent to us, they convert the, um, using carbon and UV light and water, they convert that into um, usable energy. So that's one carbon sink. Anytime we use carbon, uh, we release uh, energy. So if I look at this carbon cycle in here, let me present it so it's bigger. So when I look at this guy right here, this carbon cycle, uh, the sun's energy, carbon is uptake by this plant. The, the, the cooperation of those allows this material, um, allows this guy to become a sink. But other anything that photosynthesizes promotes a carbon sink. So the ocean, really the biggest component of the ocean are all those little teeny organisms that are floating through the water um, column. And those are, the majority of them are, are photosynthesizers. So anywhere that we have something that has chlorophyll that's able to photosynthesize, they become our carbon, they become our natural carbon sink. Um, when we burn a tree, we release carbon back into the atmosphere, among other things. Uh, when we harvest plants um, to eat them, uh, over time, they're gonna be released back into the atmosphere because that's just the way everything works. Everything goes back into the atmosphere. It's transferred through wind or water through all of our different cycles. Um, and, and we have these natural carbon sinks. All right, so the reason I'm fumbling a little bit is this. Um, because we have this self-sustaining way of managing all of our carbon, uh, we have to come up with another way to capture the excess because we are now releasing more carbon into our atmosphere. So why does that matter? Why do we have to have these carbon sinks? When UV light goes through, um, the atmosphere, it doesn't interact with global warming gases. And by the way, global warming gases, that term is so um, considered so politically charged, but we've actually been using that for a long time. And if we didn't have them, we would be Mars. Like we would be frozen, we'd be the frozen planet. Um, but when UV light passes through the atmosphere, it doesn't interact with the global warming gases. When it interacts with our global warming gases is, when it bounces back up. So when it comes in this way, it passes through our atmosphere. It doesn't interfere or interact with our global gases. Um, it does warm us, right? It does, it does cause warming of the planet, um, but it's when the, the UV light is changed and put back up into the atmosphere and it becomes IR light, it's at the right length that it interacts with our global warming gases. So gases are, um, you know, they have multiple atoms 
and they have bonds. So think of the bonds between the atoms. If you guys could picture if I had, um, you know, I'm holding two round objects. Imagine that I had a rubber band linked around them. When the UV light passes from the sun to the earth, it does nothing to the rubber band. But when it hits the earth and bounces back up and changes its wavelength from that action, now the vibrational mode is interacted and now my rubber band becomes tighter or it starts vibrating. And it's that vibration that creates the friction that causes the warming. And we want that to happen. Like that's gotta happen. If that doesn't happen, we're Mars. The problem is every time we release more carbon, more methane, any of our gases that interact in that way into the atmosphere, we're putting more collectors of the IR light. And by the way, the whole idea of starting in your yard is another way you can prevent or reduce the amount of, of light. So we're supposed to have 51% is supposed to you know, be captured and put in that to build our own carbon sink of energy. Um, but in some regions of the world, this 51% is way lower and in an urban setting like Elgin, it's way lower because we have something called albedo happening. That's the reflection. That's a re reflectivity of, a, of an object. So anytime a UV light hits something that's reflective, like concrete, like turf grass, like a road, even a, natural things like a, a water or a pond or a lake, we're increasing the amount of rays that are being reflected into IR that are available to do the interaction and we're reducing the amount of rays available to capture those and sequester them. So because this is happening, we have to do a couple different things. One, we have to find new ways, like we had to find new ways to pollinate in China. We have to find new ways to sequester carbon because we're reducing the amount of plants that we have to sequester. And some plants are good at, at sequestering carbon and some aren't. So some of our natural, you know, some of our crops are not as good um, at efficient photosynthesizers. So by transferring our turf grass, by transferring um, our concrete, by being cognizant of the reflectivity we have in our yards, things that are giving off light, um, and changing those to things that can capture the carbon, we're also contributing to the reduction of, the, of this activity of this, this albedo effect that also is complicating climate and, and warming up our, our atmosphere. So you will, if you, if you um, put into Google um, um, carbon se um, sequestering, you're gonna see that that's actually a huge field right now. In fact, um, I think it's Elon Musk who's offering, I think it's like one or $2 million for somebody who can come up with a, with a practical way to sequester carbon, which in most cases is gonna end up being, um, you know, capturing that carbon and putting it back in the earth, which ironically, <laughs> it's because going back to the fracking, we keep, you know, it's sequestered. That's what, that's what, that's what fossil fuels are. It, it, that's the natural sequestering. So now we have to come up with ways to, to mimic that natural system and put the carbon back in the ground. Um, and if you can come up with a way to do it, you're gonna, you know, contact Elon Musk because he's gonna pay you $2 million. Well, Deb, we thank you so much for um, your gift today, your gift of time and your expertise. And I'm going to try to share my screen here to bring some more last minute information to people. Um, and say again, thank you to our um, partner, the, hold on here, the, the library. And, um, also to remind those of us remaining that there's a bonus for staying here. Uh, you will get a little um, certificate uh, as, a, as uh, um, a member of this presentation. And that certificate 
you will be able to uh, redeem at the plant sale, which is coming up. And if I can get to that slide, let me see. Here it is. There are three um, dates for the Wild Ones plant sale, native plant sale. And the first two dates are um, for members only, their pre-orders and that kind of thing. The third date listed will be open to the public, but we are going to be operating with COVID protocols for that. So you can find more about this on our uh, website for Wild Ones and our website for uh, startinyouryard.com. Um, I am so happy that you are wanting to learn more about the Start In Your Yard initiative and all these topics that pertain to it. We thank you for coming and um, hope to see you down the road. Thanks. Thank you for coming, everybody. Lots of thank you notes in the uh, in the uh, chat or in the in the chat and the. Oh, that's so nice. Yes, I'm reading these. Thank you.